This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Utopia As we find ourselves standing on the cusp of the holiday season and with the looming end of the old and beginning of the new that is the new year, we have to confess something. We here at the Word of the Week are tired. As we scramble to finish projects and get ahead of our work so we can justify running off for two weeks for a Christmas vacation with our families, which we know will be filled with a flurry of activity and not at all relaxing, we find ourselves wishing we could simply disappear to some calm, quiet place where all of our needs are taken care of. Where we don't have to work or worry. Where stress is a thing of the past. Where things are just perfect. We long for utopia. Now, if you're a fan of fantasy or science fiction, you'll probably be immediately familiar with a particular brand of science fiction known as dystopian fiction, and doubtless we don't have to explain the link between utopia and dystopia. A utopia is a fictional nation, state, or community that offers basically a perfect life to its citizens. Everyone's needs are met, there is no conflict, and none of the perceived evils of society and humanity are tolerated nor do they even exist. A dystopia is the fictional counterpart to a utopia. Dystopias are awful fictional places where the people are miserable and oppressed and suffer every problem imaginable. If you watch movies or TV shows or Netflix original series, you might be tempted to think that dystopian fiction is enjoying some kind of sudden surge, perhaps in the last decade. And that would be fair enough. After all, ten years ago, author Suzanne Collins published the first in a trilogy of teen dystopia novels, The Hunger Games. Four years later, the book was a highly successful motion picture, and in the same year as the film's release in 2012, The Hunger Games books had broken the Amazon sales records held previously by the Harry Potter series. And the film series went on to make almost $3 billion on a combined budget of under half a billion dollars. The Hunger Games tells the story of a teenage girl named Katniss Everdeen, who, to protect her sister, takes her place in a televised teenage battle royale. See, at some point in the unspecified future, a post-apocalyptic North America ends up resource-starved and under the control of a totalitarian regime. In a classic bread and circuses maneuver, the wealthy and decadent aristocracy keeps the oppressed masses placated by forcing teenagers to participate in a televised battle royale. It's like Fortnite, but with innocent people's children. And with ghost dogs and robot wasps instead of that storm thing. We should note that the term bread and circuses, which refers to the practice of keeping an oppressed populace docile with entertainment and food stuff, is highly appropriate here, even though we know our more devoted Hunger Games fans are going to point out that technically the people are starving and the entertainment is meant to distract from the lack of bread. But first, the winners earn bread. Second, the term bread and circuses refers less to the specific method and more to the general idea of placation and distraction to keep people from rising up against the government. The phrase comes from a series of poems penned by the Roman poet Juvenal in a 100 CE. In the tenth of his series of satires, that was the title of his poems, The Satires, Juvenal criticized the Roman government for wasting money on costly gladiatorial games and free grain initiatives to buy the support of Roman citizens who had no real representation in their supposed republic. Okay, that really isn't The Hunger Games. It's actually closer to The Running Man, a 1982 novel by Stephen King that was adapted into a major motion picture in 1987 starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. In that completely different story, the wealthy and decadent corporate elite distracts the citizens of a post-apocalyptic and resource-starved United States with a series of brutal televised blood sports. In the book, the main character, Ben Richards, ends up volunteering to participate in a battle royale type event to protect his daughter and provide for his family. So it's completely different. And speaking of battle royale, there was the 1999 Japanese novel by Koushin Takami which was turned into a motion picture in 2000. That one was called Battle Royale. In it, a totalitarian government forces a bunch of teenagers and blah, 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 blood sport, red circuses, you get the picture. Anyway, after the Hunger Games became a big thing, 
there was a spate of other teenagers overthrowing totalitarian regimes and terrible dystopian futures. There was that Maze Runner kid, for example, and many, many more. And there have also been some recent dystopias that didn't involve children and blood sports. For example, the recent Netflix series The Handmaid's Tale tells the story of an oppressive future in North America, specifically New England, in which women are the oppressed property of a brutal totalitarian patriarchy established by a fundamentally religious terrorist group. Based on the success of these sorts of stories, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the dystopian fiction thing is going through a sort of renaissance or surge or something. You might also be of the misconception that dystopias are all about political satire to counterbalance the idea of a philosophical utopia. Well, guess what? Dystopian fiction is older than you might think. And while it did appear as a way of shining a light on the worst evils of society and amplifying them to serve as a sort of cautionary tale, it turns out that that was precisely what fictional utopias did too. The word utopia was invented as a snarky pun. And what is generally regarded as the first fictional utopia was actually a decadent and aristocratic nightmare that eventually suffered an apocalypse. Dystopian fiction isn't new, and the basic ideas of dystopian fiction just tend to keep cropping up in fiction itself. The Hunger Games was preceded by Battle Royale, which was preceded by The Running Man. Heck, The Handmaid's Tale isn't even recent. It's based on a book that was written in 1985. And of course, there were literary greats writing about dystopia long before Atwood and King were born. The history of dystopian fiction includes such great works as George Orwell's 1984 and Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. And we could go on discussing the plots of those various books and how they reflected the various fears and social evils of their respective days. But what's more interesting is the word origin of the word dystopia. The word dystopia first appears in print in 1952, and the idea behind the word was simple. It was meant to connote the opposite of utopia. Where a utopia is the best of all possible places, a dystopia is the worst of all possible places. In fact, dystopia comes from the Greek prefix dis, meaning bad or wrong or abnormal, and topos, meaning place. The word means bad place, pure and simple. Oh wait, did we say the word first appeared in print in 1952? It turns out that scholars recently discovered that's not quite right. First of all, there was this speech given by philosopher John Stuart Mill in 1868 to the British House of Commons. But even earlier, there was apparently this book of essays and poems called Utopia or Apollo's Golden Days in 1747. And it contrasted utopias and dystopias and used the word by name. Well, sort of, because it's spelled dustopia. That's D-U-S. Now, while we're skipping over providing a survey of dystopian fiction through the ages, very special mention had to go to one particular book. The Iron Heel, by American author Jack London, and published in 1908 by Macmillan. The reason it deserves such special mention is because it is generally recognized as the first example of dystopian speculative fiction. The Iron Heel is an anti-capitalist tale of wealthy American businessmen who gain control of the free market and use it to secure their power and form a repressive government. A group of revolutionaries attempt to move against the oligarchs only to be crushed by a preemptive strike by the all-too-prepared government. The novel ends with the protagonist, Avis Everhard, going to start a new revolutionary movement, one that will win. And then the book ends, basically by saying, and then she had to run away and nobody knew what happened to her, and that was centuries ago anyway. Now, as we mentioned, it is very common for dystopian fiction authors to use their work to provide political commentary. In fact, it's pretty much a defining feature of dystopian fiction. And dystopian fiction exists for pretty much every political bent under the sun. But the origins of utopia are generally held to be a bit more high-minded. Today, we understand a utopia not as a narrative tool, not as a setting, 
but as a philosophical device or thought experiment, a way of exploring moral, social, and political ideas. And that's only natural considering that the word utopia is of Greek origin, and it means good place. It comes from the Greek topos, meaning place, and the word eu, that's E-U, meaning good. Right? Not quite. The word utopia is not a Greek word at all. It was actually invented in 1516 by an English writer and author named Sir Thomas More. And the very clever More meant it as a pun. Yes, it was meant to evoke the Greek, and yes, it was meant to seem as if it meant good place or perfect place. But by not including the E at the beginning, More was actually saying there was no such place. See, there's another prefix in Greek. Ou, that's O-U, and it means no or none. A utopia was no place at all, and it is a general misunderstanding of his writing that led to the belief that a utopia was a perfect place and started a movement among social philosophers of trying to imagine perfect societies. The story starts with the birth of Thomas More in England in 1478. His father, Sir John More, was a prominent judge so Thomas enjoyed a good education at St. Anthony's School in London and served as a page in the household of a prominent archbishop. Moore studied Greek, Latin, and Italian literature and then moved on to study law at Oxford. But he didn't originally intend to follow in his father's footsteps. Instead, he wanted to pursue the life of a scholarly monk. And for a time, he lived in a monastery. And he was so sure of his calling that he risked being disavowed by his father while testing his resolve in the monastery. But Moore came to the conclusion that he would serve God's will better by serving the common people in politics and law. However, he still remained strong in his Catholic faith. And that was going to cause a lot of trouble later. Moore became a lawyer, and then a judge, and then a statesman. And he distinguished himself as being fair, an egalitarian, a shrewd negotiator, and a general patron of the poor. Things were going very well for Moore until his wife passed away during childbirth, leaving Moore a widower with four children. And then in 1515, he met a mysterious stranger while on a diplomatic mission to Belgium who had lived on a mysterious island nation that was completely devoid of human evils thanks to its collectivist economy free of both political and religious hierarchies. The island was named after its founder, General Oedipus, of course, Moore is utterly skeptical, and he has a series of long dialogues and conversations in which he argues that there is no way to eradicate human evil or human misery on earth, but it can be mitigated with fair laws, tolerance, egalitarianism, justice, and moral virtue. Except that didn't really happen. It was a book Moore wrote called Utopia. To be clear, Moore really did travel to Antwerp, Belgium on government business in 1515. But Moore was also a writer, and he was a fan of the classic dialogues of Greek philosophers. And the thing is, things were becoming somewhat religiously charged in Europe at the time. There was a lot of outcry against perceived corruption in the Roman Catholic Church. The Protestant Reformation was getting ready to be a real thing at this point and a lot of Renaissance scholars were questioning pretty much all of the old social, political, and religious structures, and Moore wanted to weigh in. So he wrote his book, Utopia, and he told the story of a completely fictional meeting between himself and a sailor from the perfect island nation. And the book proved pretty popular. Popular enough that it became something of a philosophical fad for authors of the day to write their own stories about what perfect societies would look like to illustrate their ideas. And in that, they completely missed Moore's point. The sailor in the story is presented as this shady, obviously untrustworthy character who at best is only presenting the best side of his fictional land. Moore, the narrator, is a hardened skeptic who finds the holes in what the sailor is describing and presents counter-arguments about how good can be practically achieved. The point is that there can be no such thing as a perfect society on Earth. That's why it's no place. 
and focusing on trying to accomplish that instead of trying to mitigate the evils you see around you in a practical way will lead you to folly. Now that's the important part of Moore's story for our purposes. But we should point out that he was eventually sainted by the Catholics. Which is why he's often called Saint Thomas More. And if you remember our episode about saints, you'll know that the title comes with a hefty prerequisite. You have to die for your faith. And More did. Eventually, Martin Luther started that whole Protestant Reformation thing, and there was a lot of ugliness between Catholics and Protestants. More himself wrote several responses to the Protestant movement and became an outspoken supporter of Henry VIII and Catholicism in England. More tried to walk a fine line between his own fair and egalitarian viewpoints and the hardline anti-Protestant position the Crown was taking. He even tried to get free speech legislation through Parliament in 1523. And then, Henry VIII wanted a divorce. This is a pretty famous story, and a footnote to our story, but it ends with Henry VIII basically telling the Roman Catholic Church that he, Henry VIII, was the Pope of his own church now, and he could have all the divorces he wanted, and more snubbing the wedding and coronation of Henry's new wife. Suddenly, Moore found himself subject to a bunch of trumped-up corruption charges, thrown in jail, and eventually executed. But that utopia thing. See, what's really funny about Moore's purposeful attempt to evoke the Greek philosophers with a dialogue-style political treatise, that is, a work that plays out as a hypothetical conversation between two or more characters to explore various ideas, and the complete misreading of it by focusing on the pretend utopia instead of the conversation? Well, that's exactly how the original utopia story got started. Now, we've talked about the famously doomed island nation of Atlantis before, but it's been a pretty long time, so maybe a bit of a refresher is in order. Okay, so you have this mythical paradisical island nation somewhere in the world, right? An island nation ruled by the wise, blessed by the gods, and possessing superior technology and magic. And then suddenly it sinks into the ocean, never to be seen again. Sounds familiar, right? But Atlantis wasn't actually a mythical island at all. That is, it didn't come from Greek myths or legends or fables. It was made up by an author to make a political point. In 330 BCE. The author was Plato, and his first two books that mentioned Atlantis were two of his dialogues, Timaeus and Critias. Plato was an Athenian philosopher who was born around 428 BCE and died in about 347 BCE. He was Socrates' student and Aristotle's teacher, which makes him the sort of middle child of the big three ancient Greek philosophers. But it's only thanks to him that we know much at all about Socrates. See, Socrates was big into the Socratic method. He liked to engage his students directly in conversation and debate and make them answer hard questions. Which means he was all talk, no writing. But Plato loved to write. And a lot of his early writings starred Socrates and his buddies having all those conversations that Socrates himself couldn't be bothered to write down. Of course, later on, Plato also worked a lot of his own ideas and philosophies into his writing. And he loved to talk about morals, ethics, and social order. But he kept using the dialogue style. That is, all his works were conversations, real or hypothetical, between various members of his own social and scholarly circles. So Plato makes up this plot device, right? A fictional society called Atlantis. So called because it's in the Atlantic Ocean somewhere beyond the Straits of Gibraltar, or, as it was known at the time, beyond the Pillars of Hercules. And the whole thing might have been forgotten if not for a Minnesota man named Ignatius Donnelly, who, in 1882, wrote this book called The Antediluvian World. It claimed that all the great advances in civilization actually came from Atlantis. Plato's Atlantis. Which was actually a real place and Donnelly spun his own ideas about what Atlantis was like in with Plato's accounts. And that's why Atlantis is a household name today. 
Except actually, it wasn't really Ignatius Donnelly's fault. See, no one believed Donnelly, and he tried. He sent copies of his book to all sorts of prominent scholars of his day. They all just sort of shook their heads and said, sure, sure, Iggy, it's all real, we know. And then they made that little gesture with their finger at their temple, which means he's a wackadoodle. Even Charles Darwin basically called it bunk. And he's the guy who believed that people used to be monkeys because birds had different shaped beaks on different islands. But then some other folks got a hold of Donnelly's book. And they were hungry to sell their own brand of bunk. See, around the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s, there was this growing interest in the occult and spiritualism and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. And various societies were being founded. Societies like the Theosophical Society, co-founded by Helena Blavatsky, a.k.a. Madame Blavatsky, the famous Ukrainian spiritualist author and self-proclaimed psychic. And several spiritualists, including Blavatsky herself, started building up this mystical history of the world that included the lost continent of Atlantis as a source of great spiritual power and technology. They were basically the forerunner to that ancient aliens guy on the increasingly laughingly named History Channel. But here's the funny part. It's not that Atlantis is most assuredly a plot device that Plato used as a form of political commentary and certainly didn't exist, and that there's no other basis for it in any other ancient writing. It's that Atlantis wasn't a utopia. Not according to Plato. Plato described Atlantis as a rich, decadent, failing civilization that couldn't hold a candle to his own hometown of Athens. And if Atlantis hadn't been swallowed by the sea, it would have crumbled under its own hedonistic corruption. Donnelly and Blavatsky and all the rest recast Atlantis as a utopia and completely missed the point. Or rather, like all writers about utopias and dystopias, didn't care about the real point so much as building propaganda to make their own point. Because the real point is... There is no perfect place to escape to. The perfect place, Utopia with an E, is no place, Utopia with an O. And to fixate on it is to ignore the real, practical world around you. And as much as we'd love to escape it sometimes and take a break, we have to admit, that at least we're not being forced to compete in televised blood sports for our daily bread. So, this particular topia is maybe not so bad. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by The Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com.